Hi, everyone. This is Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from Thornhill, Ontario for webyeshiva.org. We are studying Moren of Uchim, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed. We've been using the Shlomo Pines edition, which we strongly recommend is uh, right now, uh, although we understand that a new edition is coming out shortly. But for now, this is, uh, this is really the authoritative English translation of the guide. We are uh, on chapter 7 of the third section of Moren of Uchim, page 428 in the Pines edition. This is, by the Rambam's own admission, the last thing that he's going to have to say about one of the most esoteric aspects of Jewish knowledge, which is known as Ma'ase Merkava, uh, which, uh, which addresses the way that the divine interacts with both the celestial realm and the terrestrial realm. Uh, this is really an important foundation for the rest of section three, which deals with divine providence and how God interacts with our world. But we'll get to that as we move along. What I'd like to do is because this is by the Rambam's own admission, his final word on Ma'ase Merkava, but it also represents the most esoteric or cryptic statements that the Rambam has to make on the subject because he feels a duty to uh, remain loyal to the Talmud's teaching that one should not be overly revealing about these topics. And so therefore I'm going to share with you my screen. We're going to rely heavenly on many of our of the commentaries on Moren Nebuchim to really help us unpack what the Rambam is really alluding to. And I also want to disclaim at the very outset that I am absolutely certain that the Rambam meant many, many uh, additional things, much deeper ideas than the ones that we're going to be sharing today. We're really, I feel, only scratching the surface of what the Rambam was trying to get at. The last thing that he says on this chapter, we're going to come back to this at the end of our discussion today, is do not hope after this chapter you will hear from me even a single word about this subject. For everything that it is possible to say about this has been said. I have even plunged deep into this with temerity, with omits, with great strength and courage and a little bit of perhaps, like he says, uh, guts, uh, temerity. Uh, so let's, that we will get to that when he concludes this chapter, but I just wanted to frame that for you to, to show you that he's really squeezing out this lemon as far as he feels that he can without revealing too much. So there are going to be uh, seven points that we want to make today that we're bringing out from the chapter, seven ideas, and we'll try our best to present it the way the Rambam is, is presenting it. Um, the first thing that the Rambam points out is that when we look at the first chapter of Ezekiel, the very first verse of the book of Ezekiel, we notice that scripture writes that it happened at a specific time and at a specific place. That it was the 30th year in the fourth day of the fifth month. I am in the diaspora on the Kavar River. And that's when the heavens opened up and I saw the visions of God. Now, normally when a date a time and a place is provided in scripture, there is significance to it. And the Rambam wants to tell us why there is significance. That is something the significance of which ought to be sought. And I'm just quoting from the Pines translation. It should not be thought that this is a matter without significance. And as the Shem Tov and Arboni commentaries point out, that part of what the Rambam, the Rambam is alluding to is a tie-in from the previous chapter, chapter six. One of the points that the Rambam made, it with, made with some level of hesitation is that we have to appreciate that Ezekiel was not on the same level of prophecy as Isaiah. Isaiah too saw the Merkava vision, but did not record all the details. And Ezekiel, however, did because he was like the villager who's only seeing the king and his pomp and entourage for the first time, whereas Isaiah was used to this kind of vision and therefore did not find it as remarkable as Ezekiel did. Now, based on this statement that Ezekiel was not as great of a prophet 
either because of his own personal abilities or because he was living in the diaspora at that point, far away from the place of prophecy, one should not think that Ezekiel plagiarized this vision from others, nor should one think that he extrapolated some of the details of this vision using his imagination, but not real prophecy. And, by, and, and that's the reason why the date and place are, um, are explicated in scripture. By specifying the date and place, scripture is clarifying that this was a very specific image that was uniquely Yechezkel's. And it's telling us that this was a vision in its totality at a specific time and at a specific place. We should not think that Ezekiel embellished this vision, that he added to it at some point earlier or later, and so forth. That's one explanation. Furthermore, while normally prophecy is completely dependent upon the nature of the prophet, there are times when certain times and places are more propitious for prophecy. This is especially true in the case of Yechezkel, whose, prophet, whose, who, who, uh, whose prophecy was perforce compromised because of his living in the diaspora. As a result, he needed the aid of a particular time and place to achieve this lofty prophecy. Now here, the Rambam does seem a little bit to contradict himself because in section two, when he talked about the principles of prophecy, he said that the prophecy is something that comes completely from within. It's a completely epistemological achievement that is not dependent upon any external factors. And here he seems to be implying that the fact that he was at a certain time, at a certain place, is something that contributes to his prophecy. We'll put that aside for now. But that seems to be what the commentaries are pointing out that the Rambam is getting at when he says that there's something remarkable here about the fact that scripture names a specific time and place. Now, the next point that the Rambam makes also from verse one is this idea that he sees the heavens open up. And he wants to make a point that this is a metaphor for the opening of the power of prophecy to Ezekiel. Not, there was, not that there was an actual physical phenomenon. And he says that this occurs often in scripture, as it says, Pitchu She'arim, in Isaiah chapter 26, and let the faithful nation come in, the righteous and faithful nation. It doesn't mean that literally there are gates, or as the you know more, more well-known verse in Psalms, open up for me the gates of righteousness. I will come through them and I will praise the Lord. The opening up of gates is a metaphor for a person gaining access to something to which he previously did not have access. And there are many more examples of this throughout scripture that the Rambam said, uh, enumerates, which we, will, we do not provide, but you can find in the text. That's point number two, that this is again, a completely epistemological experience. There is nothing physical going on here. Number three, pay attention to the fact, the Rambam says, that there are different aspects to the clarity of this prophecy. Some things are very clear in this prophecy, while others are where the prophet Ezekiel only captures a demut, a likeness in his vision. And we will find the word demut being used many times, both in chapter one and in chapter 10 of Ezekiel, where he has the first and second visions of the Merkava. And the Rambam doesn't really give us much more clarity about, the, about this. He does tell us when speaking about the chayot, only a likeness is described, as in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, umitocha demut arba chayot. I saw the likeness of four chayot. Um, a likeness is also used for the firmament above the chayot in chapter 1, verse 22. Udemut al rashei hachaya rakia kein hakera chanora. That there was the likeness above or on the heads of the great chaya, there was a firmament that was like awesome ice or crystal. Same for the throne above the firmament. When there's a description of the throne towards the end of chapter one, it says, um, uh, above the firmament, there is some kind of sapphire stone appearance and there is a likeness of a throne. In other words, the word likeness implies that Yechezkel is not getting an absolute crystal clear vision, but something that is akin to 
or that looks like the throne or looks like the firmament. And of course, the same thing is for the man that is described on the throne, again from verse 26, Val demut hakisei demut kemarei adam alav milamala. That upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the image of a man upon it above the throne. By contrast, the ofanim are not envisioned as a demut, but rather directly and vividly. As in verse 16 of chapter 1, it says, Mar eha ofanim, the image of the ofanim, without using the word demut. What is the difference? The Rambam doesn't tell us. But of course, he's alluding to something very important. Let us connect the dots to what the Rambam had said previously, that the vision of the Maasei Merkava is an understanding of the metaphysical realm and how it connects to our terrestrial reality. And there, as we learned in chapter 5, there are three sections to that, uh, to that vision. There's the divine, or how the divine connects with the celestial realm. Then there's the celestial realm above us. And then there's the sublunary or terrestrial realm, which is where we find ourselves. And there is a constant connection between those three realms and an emanation. The, the, uh, the man on the throne represents the divine realm. The chayot represent the celestial realm. And the ofanim represent the elements that are in the process of combining to form our terrestrial realm. And therefore, things which can be viewed empirically, such as the elements, the ofanim, can be captured with much greater accuracy than the celestial realm, which can only be approximated because man has never gone out to space. And therefore, when it says demut, Yecheskel is simply admitting that even with the vision of his prophecy, he cannot have a clarity of understanding what's going on in the celestial realm because he's never been there. But viewing the ofanim, the elements, he lives within the elemental realm, and therefore he's able to capture a vision that is much more accurate. Now note how the Rambam had stated that although Aristotle got everything right in the sublunary realm, he was quite speculative about the celestial realm. The Rambam says this a few times, but most notably and most explicitly, at the end of chapter 22 of section 2, that Aristotle was very accurate with things that he could empirically measure about the elements and so forth, but he was very speculative. And that's the same thing with the prophetic experience, the Rambam seems to be saying, is that he's connecting the two together. The same is true for the prophet, who is trying to envisage the celestial realm. Never having been there to observe things as they are, he can only approximate them, and that's why he calls them the dumut. Thus, the ofanim, which represent the elements of this realm, can be envisaged with greater clarity. Now, perhaps you will question this based on, the Rambam says, there's one exception to this, where it says the word demut in the context of the ofanim. It says, mar eha ofanim in verse 16, mar eha ofanim umasehem kein tarshish, udemut echad arbatan, where it says that there was one likeness for all four of the ofanim representing the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and air. Now, the Rambam says, if we're, if we're saying that the empirical elements, which can be seen, um, do not need to be envisaged by a demut, by a likeness, but can be envisaged cl with clarity, why then is the word demut used in verse 16? So he, he doesn't answer this, but as the commentaries point out, this likeness refers to primordial matter which Ezekiel could not see in the present tense. Uh, in other words, if you recall the way we talked about how the celestial realm influenced the terrestrial realm, there was initially this emanation from the stars that brought about what we call primordial matter or unformed matter or hule in Greek, which represents the initial formation of the elements. Initially, the elements had no form and there was only one formless element. It then, through the motion of the celestial bodies, broke up into four different layers of elements that now have the form of each respective element. And what Ezekiel is envisioning uh, in verse 16 is the demut, is the likeness of something that he has never been able to properly gauge himself, which is formless matter, which only existed prehistorically and did not exist in his time. 
nor could he perceive formless matter with accuracy, since it's not empirically detectable in our realm. Next, regarding the rakia, the firmament, there too we note that the word demut was used in chapter 1. However, the Rambam points out quite interestingly that in chapter 10, it is mentioned as a definitive vision without the word demut. As it says in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Ezekiel, that I observed. And there was this rakia on the top of the cherubim, which is another word for the chayot. Remember that in chapter 3 of the guide, the Rambam had pointed out that the chayot and the kruvim are the same thing, but they're called chayot in chapter 1 and they're called kruvim in chapter 10. But he describes the rakia in chapter 10 as ke'evin sapir kimar edumut kisei nir alehem. There, describing the firmament, he points, there is no uh, mention of demut harakia, but rather harakia. It just says the firmament. Whereas when first mentioning it in connection to the chayot in chapter 1, demut is used. And the Rambam says, understand this. He doesn't give us, he doesn't offer us an explanation. He doesn't explain this discrepancy, but as Rav Kreskis points out, the word rakia can mean two things depending upon the context. And if you recall, we had pointed out from some of the commentaries that there is a an, a, um, an opening edge to the rakia and a closing edge to the rakia. In other words, there's an edge of this firmament that divides between the celestial realm and the divine realm that first connects between the celestial and the rakia. And then there's the outer edge of the rakia, which connects between this firmament to the divine realm. And depending upon the context, uh, you will be able to determine which type of rakia we're discussing. When used in the context of what is above the chayot, the prophet is envisioning a physical barrier to divide between the celestial realm and the divine realm, which perforce must exist based on philosophical speculation that man has no access, even the celestial realm has no access to the divine realm. This is something that can be clearly apprehended by the prophet, which is the case in chapter 10. And that's the reason why the word demut, which implies a fuzzy image, is not used because philosophically one can come to this conclusion without any kind of doubt that there must be a barrier between the celestial realm where the chayot are and the heavenly realm where the kisei, the throne, is. But chapter 1 is less clear. It refers to this fuzzy image of the demut because it describes a firmament that enters the outer edge of the rakia, entering into the divine realm, having the throne directly above it. This cannot be perceived clearly by the prophet. This is what the Rambam alludes to when stating for the unclear vision, this being a proof that the apprehension of the firmament came first and that afterwards there appeared to him the likeness of the throne. The Rambam, in saying those words in our chapter, is basically saying that the only way that the prophet can get a fuzzy image of the throne is by first getting a, fu a, a fuzzy image of the firmament that leads us into the divine realm. And that's what the, the fuzzy part. The, 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 the uh, ceiling of the celestial realm is clear. But what is beyond that ceiling of the celestial realm, that's where we get into the demut and the word rakia being the ceiling and also the entry point into the divine realm means two things, depending upon the context. If it's the ceiling of the chayot, so then it's clear. There's no ambiguity. If it's the entry point into the divine realm, then that's the fuzzy area. Next point that the Rambam wants to make, the wings and the hands of the chayot. In chapter 1, the chayot are described initially as having both hands and wings. As it says in chapter 1, verse 8, videi adam mitachat kanfehem. We are introduced to both the hands and the wings of the angels in the very same verse, that it says that the, the angels had four wings and two hands, and their two hands were underneath their wings. But in chapter 10, the chayot are called keruvim, as we mentioned, and initially no mention of hands is made. Only after is there the likeness of hands underneath the wings, the demut of hands. So first it says in verse 5 of chapter 10, v'kol kanfei ha-keruvim nishma, that the sound of the wings of the keruvim was, was, was heard, 
And then, Vayera la keruvim tavnit yad adam tachad kan vehem. And then only later in verse 8 are we introduced to the hands of the keruvim. And the Rambam says, understand this. Understand why there's this discrepancy, whereas in chapter 1, the hands and the wings are introduced to us at the same time. And in chapter 10, first we learn about their wings, and it's only three verses later that we understand, that we learn that they have hands as well. Why is that? The Rambam does not tell us. So as the commentaries point out, and we discuss this in chapter 3 of the guide, the word keruv is itself indicative of a celestial body controlled by intellect, which in turn moves the insentient ofanim, the elements. That was an important point for the Rambam, that the celestial bodies are sentient, and the ofanim are not sentient, but are just li lifeless elements which are moved by the sentient chayot, or keruvim. And the word keruv itself is indicative of the fact that it is dominated by intellect, because it, it comes from the word rochev, or because the word keruv means the face of a, of a child who possesses some level of intellect. Now, what does the word wings, what does the word kenafaya mean in this very esoteric um, philosophical exposition on the Merkava? Wings represents the impetus for the motion of the celestial spheres, namely that they are impelled by their intellects to move in their orbit. That's what wings represent. What is it that causes the chayot, the celestial bodies, to move? It is that they are impelled by their intellect to, to move. We won't get into the, the, uh, the, the, the more technical discussion of how many intellects, what kinds of intellects, but suffice it to say that the wings of the chayot represent that intellectual drive that causes the celestial bodies to be in motion. Hands of the chayot represents the action they perform upon others as a result of their motion, just like productive human hands affect human handiwork, which are the product of the hands. Thus, the first chapter focuses more on the effect the chayot have on the ofanim, and thus plays up the word hands, because they are both having wings, being impelled by their sentience, and in turn affecting the ofanim, which is represented by hands. Whereas chapter 10 focuses more on the stark difference between the sentient keruvim and the insentient ofanim, to the point where handiwork doesn't even seem apt to describe a construct like ofanim, which are completely manipulated by the sentient keruvim. And what it seems, I'm just sort of extrapolating what I'm trying to understand from the commentaries. The reason why hands are not really uh, uh, in, introduced to us at the same time that the cannot find that the wings are is because there's much more focus on the sentience of the of the keruvim, which the word keruvim also also emphasizes that sentience and intellect that these heavenly bodies possess. And therefore, there's a much starker divide between the, the Kuruvim and the Ofanim. Um, and as, as such, the, 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 the fact that they are moving these uh, Ofanim is not as relevant because we want to focus more on the lofty intellect that these Kuruvim have. And consistent with this is the verse, Veha Ofanim Le'umatam that it says in verse 19 of chapter 10 that the Ofanim were facing the Keruvim since, they're, since they were completely insentient and had no form of their own, completely dependent upon the Keruvim, sort of being schlepped along by the Keruvim. So it's not even so much like handiwork, so to speak, because when you're schlepping something with you, like you have something on a backpack on your back and you're making it move, you don't even relate to that as so much as handiwork, and that's why the hands are not played up as much in chapter 10. That seems to be what the Rambam is alluding to, or at least some semblance of that. The next point that the Rambam makes is about the rainbow. Now, the rainbow appears uh, um, in chapter 1, towards the end, where we get into the most esoteric component of Ezekiel's vision, where he enters into the divine realm in his vision, and sees what is above the firmament dividing between the celestial realm and the divine realm. And as the verse says, Kimar e ha keshet 
אשר יהיה בענן ביום הגשם, כן מראה הנוגה סביב. That just like the vision of a rainbow that is that comes from within a cloud on a rainy day, so was the vision of this aura all around. Humar e demut kavod Hashem. It was the likeness of the vision of the glory of God. Vo ere vo epol al panai, and I saw this. I fell on my face in my vision. Vo eshma kol medaber, and I hear a voice speaking. Now. The Rambam says the true reality of this rainbow is known. This is the most extraordinary comparison possible, undoubtedly due to a prophetic force. Understand this. I'm paraphrasing his words. He is a little bit more ver verbose than this, but we're extracting the tamtsi to the main essence. And the, the, the Rambam doesn't tell us any more about the significance of what the rainbow represents. When we look at the commentaries, they tell us as follows. Just as a rainbow is the divided and refracted light from the sun that only comes about under unique meteorological conditions with the proper mixture of sunlight, clouds, and so forth, so does a prophet refract the divine light of God based on his unique conditions. In other words, God's divinity is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And it is a prophet who has sort of has the radio antenna to be able to receive this divine message that is surrounding us and with all of its ubiquity. It's the prophet's unique conditions that allow him to be a conduit to convey a communication from God, even though the, the communication is everywhere. Similarly, sunlight on a, on a day, on a, on a, during the daytime is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. But you can only get a rainbow under certain meteorological conditions where the clouds and the sun combine to refract light and to form a rainbow. That's, in essence, a metaphor for the, con for the condition of prophecy, that even though God's light, God's rays of div divine intellect are everywhere, only the prophet, because he has primed himself to receive those rays of, of intellect, is capable of refracting them and representing them in some way. Just as the sun's light never changes, but the rainbow appears through refractions external to the sun, so does God's divinity never change. His varying prophecies are a product of each prophet's unique ability to refract that divine knowledge. Now we get to point number six, which is the last point that the Rambam will make about the specifics of the Merkava vision is this man that he sees on the throne and the accompanying chashmal and fire. Chashmal is translated in strange ways. I've seen a translation calling it electris. I don't know, I guess that's a, a play on the word electricity. We call chashmal in modern Hebrew, that's the word for electricity in modern Hebrew, but it represents some kind of bright light, a bright aura of something, maybe flashes of light, and there's an interesting vision in verse 27. He says, Va'era ke'en chashmal kemar'e eish beit la'saviv mimar'e motnav ulamala. In describing this man who is above the, the kisei, above the throne, it describes, Ezekiel describes that he sees a chashmal flashing above in the upper torso of this man that he has a vision of. And then from the lower part, part of this man's body, from his loins downwards, he sees that it is like a fire. It's not really clear what the difference between chashmal and esh are, but chashmal represents some kind of very bright flash, and esh represents the fire that you and I would see, let's see, when we're sitting in front of a bonfire. But what's the difference in that vision? The upper part of the body from the loins up has the appearance of chashmal, from the loins down, the appearance of fire. What difference does it make? Now, the Rambam starts off by quoting the Talmud, Talmud in Tractate Chagiga, which is the central point for uh, the expositions in Talmudic literature on the Maasei Merkava. He quotes uh, two points. Number one, he says, that the Talmud says that the word chashmal is a hybrid of two words, chash and mal. So the Talmud says two things. 
My chashmal, what does the, the term mean? Bematnita tana, it was taught in a brighta, itim chashot, itim mimalalot, that it represents a certain kind of creation of God that sometimes is silent and sometimes is speaking. This celestial or angelic uh, emanation of God, when it, God is speaking, this creation is silent. And when God is not speaking, then the these angelic beings are mal, then they are speaking. And then later on the Talmud says, that the angels would go to and fro, to and fro, like the image of bazak, like an image of flashing lightning. My ratso vashov, what does it mean to go back and forth? Amar of Yehuda, ko'or hayotze mi piha kivshan, like fire emanating from a furnace, sometimes going out and sometimes coming back. The Rambam says, and I believe that this secondary quote from the Gemara is where he gets his two interpretations from the word of the word chashmal. These words mean either rushing forward and cutting off, or speech and silence. So the Rambam offers us two interpretations based on the Talmud as what this hybridized word chashmal means. The word chash means to hurry, move quickly forward, and mal means to, like the word milah, brit milah, means to cut off or to be stopped or interrupted. So it's two opposites. You're either rushing forward or you're being stopped. And that's one thing that the Talmud seems to be describing about this, um, these chayot who are going ratzo vashov back and forward. Forward means that God is not instructing them, and back, God is stopping them so that they can receive their instruction. Or chash and mal means speech and silence. Chash is be silent. Mal from the word milah or miyamalel means to speak. Now, either way, the Rambam points out, the word implies opposites, demonstrating that the man in question is not representative of God himself, since, and I quote, we, God may not be presented in a likeness in a parable, understand this. Now, obviously, there are many prophecies of God in the form of a human being, and we've talked about this before, that sometimes a prophet will envisage God in the form of a human being. But here, because we're describing the divine realm uh, in great detail, and the prophet Yecheskel is trying to explain to us the metaphysical system, it is not possible that the man seated on the throne is a representation of God himself, who is completely beyond this metaphysical system and cannot be represented at all. We must therefore conclude that there is a primary emanation from God that is responsible for the motion of the celestial realm, and that is this man on the throne that is being described in this vision. Now, how do we know that? We know that because when we are describing this man, we describe him as possessing chashmal or being surrounded by chashmal. The word chashmal means a created being of God, since only a created being of God has opposite tendencies of both being an effector and being affected. When, as the Talmud says, chashmal means to be silent and then to speak. When am I silent? When I'm receiving instruction from my superior, when I need to listen to something that my superior tells me so that I can gain understanding of what my directive is to do. When am I mal? When I'm communicating with other people, giving the direct direction to those that I am in, responsible for, those that I am managing. So therefore you see that it is a a created being of God, because God is, never has to be silent to listen to his superior, of course. So that's how I know that we're not dealing with God himself, we're dealing with an emanation, a product of God, a created being that is the highest emanation that is responsible for the motion of the celestial realm. Okay, now the, that concludes the Rambam's exposition on the Merkava. And of course, as you can see, very esoteric stuff, very, um, very, very cryptic material 
descriptive of an entire system of metaphysics that the Rambam feels is something that is consistent with some level of a, a Aristotelian depiction of how our world comes into existence. Now, the concluding paragraph puts the Merkava to rest permanently. We'll read that paragraph inside. It's on page 430, and with this, we will put the Merkava to rest. We have thus given you, also in this chapter, such chapter headings, Rashi Prakim, just the basic ideas that if you combine these headings, there will emerge from them a whole that is useful with regard to this theme. If you consider all that we have said in the chapters of this treatise up to this chapter, the greater part or the entirety of the subject in question, except for a few slight details and repetitious speech whose meaning remains hidden, will become clear to you. In other words, the Rambam is saying, my dear student, connect the dots. You will figure this out if you are perceptive. Perhaps upon thorough consideration, this too will be revealed, and nothing of this will remain hidden, even the parts that I meant to completely obscure. Do not hope that after this chapter, you will hear from me even a single word about this subject, be it as an explicit statement or in a flash-like allusion. For everything that it is possible to say about this has been said, I have even plunged deep into this with temerity. We shall accordingly start upon other subjects from among those that I hope I shall explain in this treatise. And therefore, that puts the Merkava to rest. For some, that may be reassuring. It may be a relief for some. But of course, you know that even when the Rambam says, I've put this to rest, he's not telling us that the Merkava is not at all relevant to the ensuing discussions. Of course, the Merkava is where it all begins. It is where the, the heavens connect with the earth. It is where the divine connects with the terrestrial via the celestial. And it is therefore so necessary for a person studying the, the remainder of section three to keep the Merkava image in mind as we get into a discussion of the existence of evil and divine providence and how God's, God influences this world, it is all through this a chain of events that connects heaven with earth through this Merkava image. And that was the reason why the Rambam discussed this in the first place. And with this, we will conclude. And I hope there was something that you were able to get out of this today. Wishing you all a wonderful day, a wonderful week. We will commence Bezrat Hashem with chapter eight next time.